I am Ragna and I'm the director of Textile Month this year and I'm going to welcome Robin Kang to this session and to show us into her work and into her studio and what she's um, working on those days. So we are really happy to welcome her to be part of the program from New York Textile Month. As you probably all know, New York Textile Month is um, going on and this is one of the events we are organizing. Uh, month of, the month of September is the month of New York Textile Month and this is the fifth year we do this program and originally it's initiated by Lee Edelcourt and she is the person behind this um, great idea to celebrate textiles one month a year in New York City. And this is because of the COVID we have, we are doing most of the events virtually. So we offer workshops, um, interviews, uh, lectures, um, studio visits, um, exhibition visits, walkthroughs, um, videos um, through the virtual platform. But we are also, few events are in person and one of the events is on Sunday with Robin. Uh, she will tell us more about that in the in her talk, but yeah, as I said, we are super happy to have you here, Rob, and, and that we have the opportunity to see your work and uh, to know more about it. And you have been working with, with textiles for many years, and you are combining technology and the craft of textiles in your work using the TC loom, the Norwegian TC loom, Shakart loom, and you also work in research about indigenous people in um, South America, right? And then you are exhibiting in museum and galleries and, and you are a very active artist. And that's why we are so uh, curious about your work and we look forward to know more about it. So welcome. And it's a pleasure to, you know, have your event part of our program. Thank you so much. I'm um, excited to be here and um, honored to share my work in my studio with all of you. So thank you very much um, for hosting and inviting me. So um, I am going to, well, first of all, I'm in my studio right now. Behind me is um, my uh, TC2 um, four wide um, digital jacquard loom um, and I've also I'm going to share with you my my screen so I can kind of give you a little more presentation of um, my work and see things a little better so okay so here we have um, my my loom and a piece that's being in the process of being woven on it and um, just to kind of give you a little image of um, some of the making the process behind the woven work that um, I do but before I go further into that I want to tell you a little bit about my background um, I grew up in Texas and um, went to undergrad in uh, West Texas among the cotton fields um, of Lubbock. And um, so it was, it's an interesting thing how some of these, uh, these experiences really have an influence on your, um, your future trajectory, where you come from. Um, I studied in my BFA photographic arts. I, have, um, I was studying fine art but um, specifically digital photography. And it was a time when um, Photoshop was just kind of making its way onto the scene. And um, so I really became very affluent in Photoshop and focusing a lot on layering of images and um, pixels. And I think that really came into play with um, how I started viewing textiles from a technological perspective and really thinking about the pixels um, that make up a weave structure and, um, and how uh, small components added together can um, be added to create like a greater pattern structure of the whole. So um, I think all of that 
later became um, fascinations um, with uh, what now becomes a huge part of my practice where I utilize Photoshop, a customized version of Photoshop um, to construct my own leaf structures and pattern images um, for the digital loom that I work with. So part of the inspiration for the artwork that I make um, comes specifically from the history of weaving and its relationship to the development of technology. And um, one can't discuss that without referencing um, the Jacquard loom. Um, this famous invention um, was the uh, first mechanized um, loom that involved the use of a punch card system, which you can see here. And um, the punch cards um, kind of would be draped around and each, each punch card would basically lift um, the threads in a complex format um, along the, um, the warp of the cloth. And so each basically line of threads would have its own punch card, um, creating a complex cloth. And so um, this really was the first um, machine to ever use a binary system. And later the inventor of uh, this machine, um, Joseph Marie Jacquard, um, this is a, the famous portrait um, that he had woven that required 24,000 punch cards. Um, and he had documented correspondence with another inventor who, um, Charles Babbage, who um, utilized this punch card technology in what would be like a tabulation machine later purchased by a company that would be, go on to become IBM. So there is um, a direct relationship between this Jacquard loom and um, the invention of uh, our contemporary computing kind of technological world. So um, I love this connection. And the other thing that's interesting is um, the ability that this loom um, granted for um, weaving what, what became a photographic image, where before that it was um, a lot more um, patterns and repeat patterns. So this was an exciting invention in the, um, the world of weaving. And for someone who's studied um, photography, this is an interesting connection um, uh, between uh, being able to weave an image. Um, so I had the extreme privilege of going to graduate school at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And um, there um, I was really fortunate to uh, study with the amazing, talented weaver um, and artist Christy Matson, who was one of the first um, people in uh, the United States to work with um, the Norwegian uh, loom, the TC1 and also the TC2. Um, you can see both of them are an example here, the TC1 kind of, it doesn't have the covers <laughs> on it um, and some other th uh, differences as well. But um, I had the privilege of studying with her and um, really getting my hands um, on this new technology early on. And um, it's a really an exciting tool for an artist because um, it allows um, a freedom to be able to weave photographic images um, with the independent heddles lifting um, like they would in an industrial jacquard um, loom at a mill. However, um, the shuttle is thrown by hand and so this also allows um, an experimentation and a handmade element that I was particularly interested in as a visual artist, um, being able to make one of a kind works and woven pieces, um, still engaging with a technological process, but each piece um, has its own uniqueness and um, the hand is still present. So here is a picture of my studio and my loom, um, just a little specs on my loom. I have the TC2 four wide, so it's the largest of the TC2 models. Um, and I have 16 modules and I have them currently um, set up four by four um, at uh, 60 ends per inch. And um, I think that that totals about um, 3,520 heddles, uh, threads, excuse me, um, wide. 
and my weave width is about 56 inches. So it's a pretty large um, undertaking, <laughs> especially because this, this particular um, style loom is still um, hand threaded and dressed just in the same way you would dress a floor loom. And so um, I wind my warps using um, a warping mill um, and then um, hand thread them through the heddle. So it's, it's quite an undertaking each time I do the, the new warping, but it's worth it because it's exciting to work on this type of machine. So um, also in this picture, um, I wanna point out um, a lot of my yarns that I work with for my, my wefts. Um, well, first of all, my warp, I use a 22 mercenized pearl cotton for my warps usually. And then my wefts are um, a wide range of materials. Um, I like to create texture by using um, a variety of weft yarns. So um, all kinds of thicknesses and thinness and um, different, some uh, organic materials, some synthetic, um, a lot of metallics um, as of recently, and um, even some unusual materials uh, such as uh, uh, plastic bags and um, other materials that sometimes will be added into the process. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, another influence um, while I was at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago was studying with um, some artists that were part of um, the glitch movement, which um, utilizes um, technology and the screen as a medium and specifically engaging in um, various programs and technologies um, with um, forms of hacking and um, different ways to bend and break and twist the way that we would normally engage a certain um, operating system or format um, to kind of see what is actually possible within the realm of all the pixels on the screen. And this was really influential to me, um, thinking about how I can engage the, the um, much more tangible kind of technology of weaving um, in this similar fashion. So um, I feel that this was an influential um, and interesting way. And um, another strong influence was um, in addition to learning about um, the jacquard uh, connection to the punch cards and its relationship to the history of the computer, um, there is uh, this object, which is um, called a ferrite memory core or core memory. Um, that was the earliest form of um, memory storage um, hardware for early computers. And the center portion is actually um, hand woven copper wires and where um, two or more of the wires intersect, there are these um, little iron beads that um, get magnetized with a positive or negative charge that um, allows a current to either go through or be blocked. Um, kind of creating a binary um, form of data that uh, will uh, then, I guess, create a, a source of information. Um, so this technology um, I found to be really exciting um, to see this kind of handwoven element really at the core of memory storage and um, another cross um, example of the way that weaving um, was integral to the development of our um, contemporary technological landscape. So um, with that in mind, a lot of my early works um, involve uh, imagery of um, some of this um, computer related hardware. This piece is a uh, core memory, woven core memory. Um, I collected a lot of early hardware as inspiration. So um, I'll just kind of toggle back and forth between images of those and some of my works. So you can kind of see the relationships of the inspiration. And this is the, one of the first large pieces that I wove on my loom. Um, so it's a pretty um, good sized wall um, hanging tapestry. It's called Phantasmic Data Dawn. And you can see the inspiration of the memory core and also some of the variation of the yarns, some of the um, like especially kind of in the bottom area there's like some larger tufted um, 
wool batting and some kind of plastic bags from the bodega where I would get my lunch in Brooklyn, um, just to kind of add unusual textures and in a way engage this glitch experience of a structural system um, that otherwise would have been very um, specific with um, weaving on this computer. So here's some more um, of the memory core and computer hardware inspiration and uh, one of my pieces. Um, I also started engaging in this idea of creating my own um, kind of uh, analog gradients with the way that I would weave the colors um, to mimic um, some of the gradients that are very prevalent on our screens. Um, so there's that. Um, there's another woven piece. It's inspiration. I'm seeing some of the ways uh, the gradients work. Um, and I would kind of, I like to play as I weave too and um, allow there to be some um, spontaneity in some of the ways that the colors interact and um, unusual experiences that almost glitch up the, um, the structure that would have been a, a planned out textile. So here's some more hardware. The piece on the left is actually um, a uh, the memory uh, card for an Atari game console, if you remember those. And later it became um, part of the inspiration for this work, which is called Atari Twin. And in this piece, um, I'm taking some of that imagery. And of course, like that's a springboard for um, also manipulating it. And um, I also started engaging in um, mark making, digital mark making uh, by using like a spray brush in Photoshop or pen tool gestures and thinking about um, how exciting it was to be able to weave uh, these, these digital marks um, and how this kind of was like the first time for, to be able to engage in that type of woven mark making from this mediated um, experience of the computer, but then um, the final output is actually very hands, handmade. I'm also um, playing with um, the typical uh, way of engaging um, fringing techniques and um, allowing broken threads and wild experiences to be um, encouraged and um, what does that mean as far as um, dialogues about sloppy craft or um, even this idea of the hand and the machine and the glitch? Um, those are all some of the inspiration. So this is another work where maybe I'm engaging the fringing technique with a little more tradition, um, but also keeping um, some kind of glitchiness or wildness in my salvages. Um, so that the, the viewer can also realize that there's some variation of materials happening and kind of even trace them back into the piece um, by seeing how they trail off on the edge. It's another large scale piece where, again, engaging in the, um, the manual gradient and the um, unusual fringing techniques and some of the um, pin tool uh, digital mark making more of that kind of mark making and allowing this idea of like the broken thread or the wild thread to also be a linear element in, um, in the art, art piece. And again, uh, you, the, this concept of glitch was very much on my mind during this body of work um, and kind of engaging in what that, what that means um, in a craft form that is normally very um, precise and um, well thought out, structured. So another um, inspiration point for me um, was as I was looking at different kinds of hardware, um, I began uh, being really inspired by um, integrated circuits, um, specifically from around the 1970s, um, mainly because their shapes, the geometric abstraction kind of elements um, are really beautiful visually. And um, I enjoyed the, the shapes that were um, kind of formed naturally through this technology. 
And also, um, I guess it was kind of this golden age because just 10, 20 years later, things start getting um, exponentially more complex, the integrated circuits, and um, they would be a lot more difficult to weave at a 60 ins per inch or in its uh, equivalent of 60 um, DPI, I guess, on the screen um, with the, with the um, loom technology that I have. So this is really kind of like the sweet spot of the design of the integrated circuit that I'm inspired by. So here's some examples of some of the woven pieces inspired by um, that. And here you can also see I'm engaging in some multiple weave structures, which is another thing that the TC2 loom um, has capability of doing um, versus a floor loom where you kind of select one weave structure for the entire piece. So there's some diamond weave structures in this and then also some um, um, satin damask weave structures next. Um, then I, I, along my research about early computers and integrated circuits, I came across an article um, about uh, a semiconductor plant in New Mexico on a um, Navajo or Diné um, reservation. Um, that to me was really interesting because um, these um, weavers on the reservation were really um, targeted to um, work on um, some of these computer hardware pieces um, at a really integral time of computer development. And um, I think that there needs to be more um, spoken about this and um, credit given to um, these talented artisans that and the dexterity of, of their making abilities that were utilized um, this time when early hardware was very um, hand assembled. So more inspiration of the integrated circuit in my work. The uh, white color is actually a metallic silver that's only really photographed <laughs> so well, but in person it has like a nice glint to it. There's another example of the selvages being used as a linear element, as a design um, aspect in the work. Um, again, the fringe, kind of a play on the fringe and salvage and um, what that means to uh, have like a woven painting. Here's a video of my process. You can see what it's like to weave on the TC2. Um, and really the hand element that happens that a lot of people kind of have an assumption that there's a computer weaving it and I push a button and it weaves it for me. Um, but it's really, a, there's a lot more that goes into it than that. Um, I, I construct my files on the computer and design the weave structures on the computer and then translate that information to the operating system for the loom and then um, basically use a single foot pedal at the bottom of the loom um, to advance to each, each um, the next thread. Um, according to the files that I program, but each thread is also is then hand hand thrown, like a, just like in a floor loom. So I have that, and then um, this is another view, <laughs> bird's eye view of the weaving process. And it gives you a, a little bit more of a, a picture of the width that I'm working with. Um, kind of often involves like a shuffle back and forth because it's so wide. And so there's really a very physical aspect to this work um, that um, I feel like people can feel but maybe are not always fully aware of. Um, so I'm going to kind of show that. And depending on the thinness or thickness of the yarns I'm doing or how many colors are in each are in the file that I'm working with, um, you know, this process can be incredibly labor-intensive and tedious. I'm actually going to skip ahead to a portion of the video that shows, um, I talked about the glitch being inspiration um, in some of the pieces. Sometimes I add, like in the, for instance here, I, I'll add, you know, um, an, an extra material in, in um, by hand to kind of uh, 
create a variation or a wonkiness within um, the line, linear structure. So um, that's just an example of some of that process and how, how it happens um, when weaving. So here's another piece, um, another large wall piece. This is based off of the uh, uh, core memory um, uh, object that was designed in Tokyo, which is kind of a rare version. A lot of them are from the USSR and the United States. There's another large work playing a lot with mark making and red um, being a line element, breaking uh, lines and um, or exaggerated use of fringing techniques. Got another example of mark making and um, the threads being linear elements. Um, this was my first commission with um, Arts Brookfield um, for the lobby of the Brace Building near Bryant Park in New York City. And um, this, this body of work um, was called Active Circuits. And um, basically I, I created nine integrated circuit chips that each of them were based on with an intention of a um, of a virtue and the idea was it would kind of create this little network that um that the in, that the viewer would have to navigate through on their way to the elevator <laughs> and um they essentially would become the current within the circuit of um, of these chips. And um, all these pieces are actually double-sided too. So um, and, um, what you can't see really with a photograph is they all involve metallics, different metallic silvers and golds and coppers. So the, sh the back side um, really shine, especially in the light with the metallic lines. There's another view of some of the works in that piece. And this is an exciting way to display them too to really allow the fabric to be what it is. It's not on the wall, it's 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 tapestry. Um, and being able to see the yarns and make it up. There's um, some other examples. I'm starting to work with the patterns of um, weave structures within the works themselves. And actually the silver here um, is an iridescent yarn, so it really has almost like a rainbow effect in real life. Same with this one. And this one is with gold, golden uh, metallic yarn. Here also. And then now I want to discuss um, some of my um, collaborations and research, because um, I feel like it's a large part of my practice is learning about ancient textiles and different techniques. Um, so this piece was woven um, with the textile lab at the textile museum in Tilburg in Holland. And um, that, this was a super exciting opportunity that I had um, to weave on their industrial jacquard looms with the teams that run them there. And so it was a very different experience in my hand um, loom, hand jack jacquard loom, but um, a lot of the same um, things translate. So we, uh, this was an exciting um, process and there's uh, a lot of metallics involved in this piece and I used double cloth in the center of the uh, memory core so it's actually stuffed like a pillow and um, almost like you can fall asleep on this memory core. It's very um, life size in relationship to the body um, and so I, I made a series of, of these in different colors when um, I worked with them. And on that trip, I also was able to study um, some of the textile history um, of both Holland and um, Belgium and some of the beautiful uh, tapestry history that that comes from that region it was really exciting. And um, connected to that, um, I made another a journey to um, Denmark to um, study at Copenhagen University Center for Textile Research. Um, and meet some of the faculty at the Royal Library and view a lot of the ancient Scandinavian textiles that have been preserved in the ice bogs there and um, some of the amazing research that is happening. Um, that institution was um, super um, inspiring to me. 
Another really um, exciting and inspiring experience was visiting um, the Tinkoi Gathering of the Textile Arts, which is an international weaving conference at the Center um, of Textiles, Traditional Textiles in Cusco, Peru. And um, there I was able to participate in um, a lot of workshops and lectures um, from indigenous artisans all, from all over the world, but um, a lar large amount of the workshops were given from the Andean women, um, the women from the Andean region and the Quechua traditions um, in backstrap loom weaving and also the traditional um, natural dyeing techniques from that area. And um, this was so exciting for me, um, inspirational to see this, these ancient technologies still alive and well and the cultures that are um, really working with them and um, keeping them alive, especially the knowledge of um, the uh, utilizing um, natural dyes. Um, so that inspired me to want to return and um, I, I came back and specifically wanted to um, give back to uh, a lot of the women artisans who had inspired me so much. Um, so I ended up working with um, the Young Weavers group from Chawai Chire, which is um, in uh, the, near the Sacred Valley, um, the Cusco region of Peru. And here um, the idea was to support the young weavers who are taking the time to really learn the ancient traditions involving the natural dyes. And so um, I purchased a lot of um, handwoven and natural dyed items from them that I'll share more about what I'm doing with those things in a minute. But um, this was really fun, um, exciting experience and um, learning about um, the process, all the processes. And um, another very impactful experience for me was um, apprenticing with um, the Shipibo elder Amalia Bordalis Franco, who um, is part of the Shipibo Kondo tradition um, in the upper Amazon of Peru. And um, the traditional textiles of her culture are um, highly connected to um, an ancient technology involving pattern structures that connect to um, vibrations of sound. And this was ex incredibly exciting to me with my connections with technology. And so I wanted to learn more and um, began studying with Amalia. Um, now it's been um, just over three years and we've been working together um, annually and she's initiated me into the tradition to um, continue to learn um, the processes and the techniques that um, are um, need to be valued more for um, the beauty and the technology that's there and um, so it's an ex ex exciting element of research for me and so again I wanted to give back so the idea was um, to create a business that supports um, indigenous artisans who um, are preserving ancient crafts that um, really need to uh, be around because they, they carry so much wisdom involving um, not just um, techniques of textiles, but there's also um, wisdom connected to living harmoniously with Mother Earth and um, how we can really approach um, our, our interaction with culture and fashion and um, beauty in a way that is sustainable. And that to me feels incredibly timely, especially given all of our current situation. So these are the women that um, I've been working with. And um, together we are, we have started a business that's in its beginning stages called Together Connected, um, where we're creating various clothing items um, that are all handmade and um, often dyed with natural dyes that come from the Chawichire region and um, all hand embroidered by the Shipibo. Um, so here's some of these items. Also, um, I mentioned before the patterns are connected to sound vibrations, but I didn't say that the sound vibrations are connected to actually healing songs. And so literally by wearing some of these garments, you're, you're, you're embodying an energy um, that's usually involves 
things like abundance or health and um, not only that, but then you're also supporting um, these cultures and um, a sustainable um, product. So it really is kind of a win-win for everybody, um, which is exciting. So here's, here's our friend of the forest um, dress and um, its natural guide as well. And friends of the forest was named um, because uh, the, the anaconda is a symbol of the forest for them, and they really are um, guardians of the Amazon, which we all know really needs our, our love and protection, especially at this time. So here's some of the items that are um, available on this, with um, this collaboration and our um, business together. And that leads me to um, my current installation that's on view at, um, it's is another kind of mission from Arts Brookfield. And um, it's called Motherboard Meditation. And it's at Cornell Tech um, University's Tata Innovation Center on Roosevelt Islands. Um, and we can view it together as an event with um, the New York Textile Month. Um, this coming Sunday from two to 4 p.m. There's a beautiful park there. We're gonna have a picnic and view the installation. But um, it's the largest wall of this um, vinyl wrap is um, 75 foot long. So it's definitely the largest project I've ever been a part of. But it really is inspired by um, imagery from audio circuits um, that I designed together and kind of um, worked with to, to mimic the threads of my weavings. Um, and the bright colors and the energy of, um, of the textiles that I've been researching with um, my Shipibo family and um, really just kind of embracing for this idea of, um, of how can we engage technology in the future in a way that is um, in harmonious with mother nature. So that's really kind of the inspiration for um, this, this new installation and um, I wanted to put this up. This is the website for the store, the collaboration that supports um, these artisans from the Amazon that in, and also from the mountain region that incredibly need our support right now because their tourist industry has been completely eliminated via COVID. So um, yeah, check it out and or if you have some type of business that would like to carry some of these products, then contact me. Um, I, I really feel that now is the time for us to really like engage and embrace each other um, as one humanity and um, also live harmoniously with the way that we interact with um, nature. So that's really my main presentation. Um, I'm going to um, go back down to this. <laughs> And I don't know if we have some questions. Um. <laughs> Let's see. Hi, Lacey. Thank you for <laughs> commenting. Um. Let's see. Um, Alexandra is asking, um, can you suggest any resources to learn more about these connections? I read The Fabric of Interface by Stephen Montero, um, and I'm currently reading Broadband by Claire Evans, finding them really helpful in understanding craft and technology on a deeper level. Um, yes, there's lots of books. If you start um, researching um, jacquard weaving, um, I feel like there's there's some some a lot of books engaging that. Um, Sadie Plants writes um, some interesting things involving technology and um, feminism. Um, there, the Computer History Museum, um, I found to be a great resource. And I think they even did an, an exhibition kind of recently on women's role in um, crafting. Um, some of the early computer parts. So those would be maybe where I would send you first. I could also, if you want to contact me, um, I could kind of look through some of my resources and try to um, give you a couple more 
um, suggestions? That's a great question. Thanks, Nina. <laughs> I don't know if there's any other questions. If um, if you want to unmute, sorry, my the lighting in my studio loses its light in the this time of day. So, <laughs> got this lamp. Maybe you can see the loom a little better. See what's on the loom. I just finished this last this new large scale piece, and it's going to be cut off um, this week. So it's kind of an exciting moment. And then um, it's time to put on a new warp. Always a process. <laughs> Does any um, hand weaver knows? So is there any, any other questions? Oh, we have some more questions coming in. Oh, there's more questions. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, how long does a piece typically take take to make? Um, Lena asked. Um, it really it really varies depending on if I'm going to make a piece that's the full width of the loom, um, or sometimes I make multiple pieces on a width and then cut them. Um, to make smaller sizes because it's, um, you know, 56 inches wide. So I've got some yardage there. And um, also the, um, it, it, it depends on how thin or thick the yarn is that I'm weaving with and um, if there's multiple colors happening because um, basically for each color, that means I have to throw the shuttle the same amount of time so it gets exponentially added onto the time. So for instance, the usually like the large piece, like the Phantasmic Data Dawn, and honestly the one that I have in the room right now, both took me um, two to three months um, to weave. And um, some of smaller size, maybe 16 by 20, could take, you know, more like three weeks, um, something like that. So it, gives, it, it varies. <laughs> Um, so Lacey says, um, she's proud of the way my work's evolving. Thank you. And, um, the, at the center of your work is connectivity, humanity, and dialogue, transformation, and healing. How do you feel that you have grown as an artist and a human, possibly one and the same? <laughs> well, tremendously. Um, I definitely feel that traveling and working with um, some of these indigenous artisans um, really changed my understanding of the ancient quality of the craft and um, and really changed a lot of aspects of specifically living um, with the Shipibo family and being in the Amazon for a month. I realized I didn't make a single piece of trash <laughs> because the food I was eating was coming from the trees and was natural and it wasn't wrapped in plastic. And um, there was just a lot of aspects of that way of living that um, are, like I said, are very harmonious with the environment. And um, that really hit home when I returned back to New York City and, you know, realized um, how, how much my day-to-day -day life is really um, having a negative impact on the environment and Mother Earth and really um, hit home with how, what changes um, I wanted to make and um, try to live more sustainably. So uh, that's one of many things. <laughs> I feel like I could go on and on with that question. We'll have to continue. Um, Helen Ramsey says, tell us what's next. Um, let's see, I, um, I have a couple projects working with, um, you know, some exhibitions coming up, some group group shows, um, a 
project in New Orleans um, next year. So um, I'm definitely working on some, some new pieces. I'm about to put a new um, white warp on the loom, which for a long time I've been working with black yarn. So this is, feels like a big transition for me aesthetically. Um, and then um, I'm really hoping for this, this business to launch more. I have, I was supposed to go back to the Amazon to work with the Shipibo women in April. And of course that got canceled because of COVID. Um, but I'm hearing through the grapevine that uh, their country might be opening in October. So perhaps this fall I might um, return um, to uh, kind of engage in the next round of our project together. And um, yeah, so, and then of course the project at Tata um, will be on view for the um, almost the entire year up until next April. So that's an exciting thing. I also have, I'm in a group exhibition um, in Brussels, Belgium right now. Um, at Matilda Hatzenberger Gallery. So those are some of the things. <laughs> Thanks for asking, Ellen. And um, let's see. Shital asked me um, what software that I design in. And um, primarily I design in Photoshop and I just utilize pattern overlays. I converted pat pattern overlays to, um, to be various weave structures involving um, a lot of damask um, shades or sh uh, satin shades. Um, and then um, some other weave structures too. So that's really my main design element, Photoshop, which fits into what I studied in undergrad. <laughs> and then, um, but the Loom has its own operating software too. So there's also, there's kind of two programs that get utilized in the process. Um, uh, speaking to the design process, um, yeah, uh, Chris was asking, so, um, I use uh, the Photoshop and um, I, I collected a lot of the um, hardware pieces from the computers and then um, put kind of uh, either take photographs of them or um, kind of draw them a little bit inspired by them and it, it ends up in Photoshop. And so I end up kind of that, that really is my sketch pad for um, the imagery of all the work. And um, then um, weave structures get overlaid on the different layers and levels, um, depending on which colors I want to be where. Um, and then um, when that is kind of all resolved and worked out, um, the final piece uh, gets translated into just a really binary um, tip file that's just black and white pixels and that's what the loom um, pro, uh, operating system understands and so um, it kind of is very um, simple in a way <laughs> technologically speaking by the time it gets to the loom it's very um, binary and then um, some fun design elements can happen once I'm on the loom um, I don't know if you were here when um, I showed the video of the weaving or not but um, that that element I can switch out colors improvisationally and things like that so even then things that have been fully planned out can have a moment of excitement and, and, and um, kind of variation during the actual making part so kind of keeps keeps it exciting for me <laughs> to do that um, let's see do you sustain your art practice through grants and fellowships mostly uh, I wish. <laughs> um, there's been a few that have been, um, you know, gifts from heaven when they come. Um, I also, there's been, um, you know, wonderful collectors and benefactors on the way that um, that have purchased my art and supported me. Um, that I'm incredibly grateful for. Um, and then also, um, you know, I'm a normal artist that um, has various other skills and jobs <laughs> that I end up doing on the side. Um, I've taught at universities and give lectures and um, teach weaving and fabric dyeing and um, various things like that. So, you know, very versatile, but 
my my vision would be that hopefully this this um, project with these women um, artisans in Peru could be a sustainable um, business model for both myself and for them um, in addition to um, grants and things like, like that um, let's see um, where do I see the work going in the future? Well, um, I'm definitely, I, I feel like I'm still marinating on a lot of the, the techniques that I've learned from um, working um, with uh, the Shipibo women. And um, I feel like it's, it's changing my color combinations. And um, I've also been studying their music and that's been something I've really been focused on, um, especially during this pandemic um which is another form of creative expression that i kind of never allowed myself to explore because i was always focused on the visual um but it's been really fun to think about um an audio component perhaps to the future of the work and um what that could do because i i have made videos in the past um, if you've seen any of my exhibitions um sometimes i have like a video element so um yeah, I think there could be audio coming in the future connected to the textiles, which um, seems right. <laughs> um, can you talk more about ancient technologies involved with um, Amalia's work and how learning about those ancient technologies has affected your own practice? Sure, this from Becca. Um, yeah, so. Um, Amalia is really um, a wisdom keeper of the ancient Shipibo um, textile techniques um, that uh, involve uh, patterns and structures that um, are connected to uh, the sound vibrations connected to um, the healing songs that, that are traditionally sung in her, in her culture. And they call these songs Icaros. And um, the various, it, 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 it kind of reminds me of um, like a science called uh, cymatics, which is basically, uh, I don't know if you've seen, there's, uh, you know, maybe YouTube videos of scientists doing experiments with um, a, an audio speaker and maybe like little beads and they would hit one tone and all of a sudden the, the beads form, you know, like this geometric snowflake like pattern and then they change the tone and then the beads shift to another pattern and so you know it's it's a scientific phenomenon that sound actually has a structure to it and so it's it's quite interesting that that um these artisans were were very aware of it and they accredited it to um and uh, working with various plants um because they're kind of you know the they have this encyclopedic knowledge of all the healing plants in the Amazon. And uh, there was this one plant that they, uh, the leaves of it grows by the water and, and the leaves kind of, uh, the veins stick out because they're like a pinkish color and they stand out in the leaf, kind of like the, the shapes of the, um, <laughs> the textiles actually. And they squeeze it into and the little juice drips from the the leaf and they drop it in their eyes like an eye drop and it's supposed to um help the women um with the visions being able to see the visions of the textiles um i tried it <laughs> i think it works <laughs> so there's a lot of funny mysteries that um yeah are 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 exciting um that you know, I think are connected to nature. So there's something science and nature and technology are maybe more harmoni harmoniously all connected. And um, that's, that gives me, you know, inspiration and just makes me want to learn more and to go back and return and um, work with them and record this and document it and learn, learn more about it myself too. Um, so yeah, there's a little bit about that. And then the other technology that they do is they, she showed me um, the, uh, this bark from a tree, a specific tree, another plant that they boil and then they dye um, the, 
different um, base cloths and then um, then this other place by the river where they would collect this kind of mud that's a specific type of clay and then they would um, draw the designs onto the 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 dyed textile with this mud and then leave it out to dry and it would be like a gray color and then um, when they would wash it off there was some kind of chemical you know reaction and the wherever the mud was would be a black and it would you know make this nice graphic design um, from the design so there was there's a lot of interesting techniques like that um, that um, our beautiful science, same thing in the in the Andes uh, with a lot of their natural dyeing techniques, you know, certain types of plants mixed together form beautiful colors <laughs> that you would never think would be natural. Um, some super bright colors come from, um, you know, various plants and the chemical reactions that happen when they um, are brought together. So there's some of that. Um, let's see, the British Tapestry Group did show a sound, uh, did a show called Sound and Weave. Awesome. Yeah, I will check it out. Thanks so much, Ellen. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, I feel like there's, um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of people kind of like, you know, learning about their tradition right now. And um, they definitely need support. Um, because, like I said, I, I really think of their, um, their culture as like guardians of the Amazon. And, um, you know, they're, they're really battling a lot of things, everything from deforestation to globalization of their, you know, their traditions kind of just getting um, squashed by the commercialized world and not valued. Um, and also just a lot of traditions that were orally passed down um, that really, um, I, I think it would, would, you know, do humanity a lot of um, good to have access to this knowledge because, um, you know, certain medicines grow abundantly <laughs> in the plants in the Amazon um, that um, might help a lot of, like, some of our serious illness problems um, and also just preserve the beautiful wildlife and lungs of our planet. So, <laughs> so I don't know if there's any more questions. I think I went through all of them. So I apologize about my lighting. It got really more dark in my studio. <laughs> Thank you all so much um, for listening and for um, being a part of this. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to anyone who wants to connect. Um, I'll, I'll pull up, I'll share my screen one more time um, with the information um, to connect with me and the project to support the women. So yeah, thanks again. And I hope to see um, those of you who are in the New York area on Sunday um, from two to four um, on Roosevelt Island um, to see the motherboard meditation um, installation and just have a picnic and enjoy the beautiful fall weather. I think it's going to be um, nice and cool. Um, I think I saw this weekend. So thanks. Thanks so much to the, um, the New York um, Textile Month for having me. I really appreciate it. <laughs>